Good evening. Hello, I'm Jeff Spence, and I am from the alumni office at Jefferson, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third talk in today's wellness webinar series. Tonight, we'll explore and compare the potential health benefits of the two, two of the most popular eating plans in the country, plant-based diets and the paleo diet. We hope that you'll learn about the effectiveness and potential risks of both diets, while learning more about the complex physical effects and factors of how these plans impact your wellness. Throughout the presentation, please share any questions you have for our speaker by using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. We will address questions at the end of the talk and we'll do our best to share as many as time allows. And now we are lucky to have Dr. Raina Marino from the Marcus Institute of Integrative Health at Jefferson as our presenter. Dr. Marino has had an extensive professional background, having received her medical degree from Medical College of Pennsylvania. She worked as a hospital-based radiologist in the Philadelphia area, while also studying nutrition and mind-body medicine, specifically focusing on how they relate to cancer. She's an award-winning author and has contributed to the medical conversation as a columnist, editor, and documentary producer. Dr. Marino began her own practice in integrative and lifestyle medicine. She's completed the professional training program at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and is a professional member of the Institute for Functional Medicine. Dr. Marino, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Jeff. It's a really a, a pleasure to be here tonight and, and thank you everyone who's joining us virtually. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. And just bear with me a second. So tonight I'm going to be talking about the paleo diet and plant-based diets and specifically looking at whether we can answer this question. Are they just fad diets or can they really be used to fight disease? My objectives tonight are to describe what each of them are, what the paleo diet is and what plant-based diets are and why they're popular and explain the differences between the two, as well as reviewing the scientific data on the effectiveness of the paleo diet versus more plant-based diets for weight loss and disease management. So let's start off by describing what the paleo diet is. It's an eating plan that's based on foods that were likely eaten by prehistoric hunter-gatherers that lived during the Paleolithic era, which was between 2.5 million to 10,000 years ago. And that era predates agriculture as well as animal husbandry. The paleo diet can differ depending on who you're reading, but typically it includes lean meat, especially if it's grass fed or pasture raised, fish, particularly if it's wild fish, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds. Sometimes eggs are included. It's also important to know what the paleo diet excludes. It excludes foods that typically were not available during that Paleolithic era, and that includes grains, also legumes, which are things like beans and peas and lentils, and dairy products. It also excludes sugar, added salt, and processed foods. Now, plant-based diets, really the, very, the definition, definitions for them really are all across the board, and they're not all created equal. If you look at the right-hand side of the slide, this is what really an ideal plant-based diet would be. Whole foods, real fruits, real vegetables, making up the bulk of the diet. If you look at the pictures on the left-hand side of the slide, they are still technically plant-based foods, but you would probably get much different outcomes in terms of your health if you focused on fruity Cheerios as opposed to red peppers and broccoli. So plant-based diets, to define them, they basically, are focusing on foods that are primarily from plants. So it includes not only fruits and vegetables, but nuts, seeds, oils, whole grains, legumes, and beans. They're not all necessarily vegetarian or vegan. Some meat, eggs, and dairy can be included. So really just, if you're wanting to follow a plant-based diet, you just want to proportionately choose more of your foods from plant-based sources. There are many different types of diets that would fit under the umbrella of plant-based diets. These can be vegan diets where there are no animal products at all. 
There can be lacto-vegetarian diets, which includes dairy, but still excludes meat or eggs. Lacto-ovo-vegetarian diets, which do include dairy and eggs, but no meat. There's also flexitarian diets, which allow meat and fish, either occasionally or small amounts daily, and they may also include some dairy and eggs. And pescatarian diets, which include fish, usually no meat or eggs or dairy. Well, what about the differences between paleo diets versus plant-based? There are three main differences. I'd say the first is the amount of meat. Most paleo diets do tend to focus a greater percentage of their calories on meat, some as high as 60%. Plant-based diets, although they can include meat, have much lower percentages. The amount of vegetables, fruits, and plant-based fats also can vary. Plant-based fats are things like olive oil, nuts and seeds, avocados. And some paleo diets do include a lot of these, but some don't really. Plant-based diets do tend to focus more on, on the vegetables, fruits, and plant-based fats. An important difference is with paleo, they really do exclude dairy, grains, and legumes, whereas most plant-based diets do include all of those. And again, the paleo diet does exclude sugar, added salt, and processed foods. So let's take a look at the popularity of the paleo diet first. This is a slide from Google Trends. And what we're seeing is that really there was peak interest in the paleo diet around 2013 and 2014. And since then, the interest has kind of dropped off a bit, although you can see that there are these peaks that occur. And probably not surprising, these peaks tend to occur around January 1st of every year when people are looking to get healthier or to lose weight. If we take a look at plant-based popularity, here again, another slide from Google Trends, it's showing that there was a, a sharp uptick in interest in plant-based diets at the end of October in 2019. And this actually coincided with a documentary that was aired on Netflix at the end of October called The Game Changers, which talked all about benefits of plant-based diets. So that kind of was, gave us this peak here around the end of October. And then interest kind of leveled off a little bit, it dropped off. But the, again, there was another peak in interest, again, not too surprisingly, around January 1st of 2020, when people, again, were looking to see how they could get healthier and also lose weight. And when we're talking about the popularity of either of these diet plans, a lot of it does have to do with the obesity problem we have here in the US. Looking at CDC data from 2015 to 2016, the prevalence of obesity was 39.8% affecting 93.3 million U.S. adults. And the estimated annual medical cost of obesity in the U.S. was $147 billion in 2008 U.S. dollars. So creating and marketing diet and exercise programs is really a very big industry. Over $70 billion is spent every year. So there really is incentive for people to create or promote diets that can capture the imagination of the, of the public. And certainly I would say Paleo diet in particular was one that, that caught the imagination of many people. And a big reason for that was the theory behind paleo diet. And that theory is called evolutionary discordance. What evolutionary discordance is saying is that there's a mismatch between what we eat in our Western diet and our genetic makeup. And that humans adapted genetically to the eating patterns of that paleo era. And our genes have not significantly changed since then. So proponents of the paleo diet say that you know, we were designed to eat this paleo way and we're only going to thrive if we continue that pattern. Also, they propose that current day chronic diseases are in a large part the result of straying away from that paleo way of eating. Now there are counter arguments to that evolutionary discordance theory. And one argument that researchers point out is lactase persistence. Now, lactase is the enzyme that is needed to digest the milk sugar lactose. And in humans, most humans have high amounts of lactase as infants, and that those levels stay high basically through the weaning period. Large amounts of the population tend to lose the amount of lactase or the lactase activity 
as they get older, but there are a lot of people in the, in the population that still maintain high levels of lactase into adulthood and high lactase activity. And so it allows them to digest milk and milk products. Well, this lactase persistence is due to a genetic mutation. And researchers have found that that genetic mutation occurred probably around the same time as the domestication of animals and the introduction of dairy consumption and dairy products in our diet. So this is one argument going against that evolutionary discord and saying that, hey, yes, we have had, we do have evidence of genes changing in response to changes in what we eat. And another example of that is that the number of genes for digestion of starches has increased since that paleo era. And of course, since the paleo era, there was the development of agriculture and grain consumption. Other arguments against this evolutionary discordance theory and also against the paleo diet is that even if we wanted to eat exactly as the hunter-gatherers did back then, it's really not possible because the species of plants and animals have changed since that time. They're really not the same. Uh, part of that is because of how we have bred certain plants. For example, we've, we've bred a lot of fruit to be larger and sweeter. And so we don't have the same plants and animals available that they did back then. Also, there's not just one paleo diet. Diets vary back then depending on the geography or the location of the population. Some populations had a majority of their animal protein from fish or seafood, where others had the majority from land animals. Also, researchers argue that we don't know for sure the percentage of meat versus the percentage of plant-based foods in hunter-gatherer diets. Some researchers say, oh, it was definitely high, 60% or more, but others cast down on that and say there may not have been some so much an animal or meat protein back then. Also, something to consider is that our modern day lifestyle is very different from those of the hunter gatherers. They were incredibly active as opposed to us today who are mostly sedentary. So dietary habits that worked for them back in the Paleolithic era may not work as well for us. What about arguments for plant-based diets? Well, of course, there is the ethical argument. Some people just don't want to consume animals or animal products. But even separate from that, there's a lot of evidence showing that plant-based diets are anti-inflammatory. They have a lot of components in them that fight inflammation in the body. And this is really important because inflammation is at the root cause of so many of our chronic illnesses today. It plays an important role in heart disease, in cancer, in diabetes. So having a diet that fights that inflammation is really important. There's also evidence that there are positive effects from plant-based diets on the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome refers to the types of bacteria that live in our GI tract. And we have both good bacteria and bad bacteria there. Plant-based diets promote the good bacteria. It helps them overcome the bad guys. And by doing that, by having more good bacteria in our GI tract, it helps us to stay healthy. It really has a key positive influence on our immune system, among many other things. There's also evidence that the plant-based diets, particularly in athletes, allow them to recover better post-workout. And the theory behind that is that a lot of these plant-based diets, they have a lot of components that are anti-inflammatory. Again, bring inflammation levels down that helps recovery. There's also evidence out there that's showing that athletes and also just regular people who follow plant-based diets just have increased energy levels or their perception of their energy is greater. Now there is that argument that people make that, well, what about protein? You know, if I'm eating mostly a plant-based diet, if I'm minimizing meat or animal products, am I going to be able to get enough protein? And actually the answer is yes. You can get all the protein that you need from plant-based sources. And I'd like to uh, quote a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Bazan, who is a big plant-based diet proponent. And he will often say to people who ask him, well, what about protein? Well, think about it. Look, think about a horse. Think about an elephant. These are big muscular animals. Are they out eating at McDonald's? No, they're eating plants. 
So what does the current research show us about paleo diets versus more plant-based diets? Well, let's take a look at this first slide. There's a lot on here, but the overall point is that this slide is referring to a study done in 2017 that looked at differences in patients who ended up developing uh, stroke. And they looked at dietary patterns and they found that people who ate a paleo diet and also people who ate a Mediterranean diet. Now, a Mediterranean diet is a type of plant-based diet that does incorporate things like grains and low-fat dairy. But both types of those eating plans were associated with lower risks of all causes of death, including heart disease, including cancer. What was interesting that the authors pointed out, though, that there was a slight advantage to the Mediterranean diet over the Paleolithic diet, although they both had lower risks of all causes of death. But one of the other things they noted was that higher nut consumption and lower red and processed meat consumption had a greater positive impact on this lower risk of, of all causes of death. A 2019 study that looked at 11 trials that compared the paleo diet to diets that were more plant-based, that promoted higher vegetable intake, but also whole grains and low-fat dairy, they found that the paleo diet group, groups were associated with greater weight loss, a greater decrease in BMI or body mass index, and a greater decrease in waist circumference. Interestingly though, they found that those beneficial effects were reduced the longer the study went on. They found that the positive effects really were seen most at six months into the studies, but after that, the positive effects tended to drop off. One of those studies in that review uh, paper was a, a controlled trial that looked at 70 postmenopausal obese women. They either ate a paleo diet or a Nordic nutrition recommendations diet. Again, that's basically a plant-based diet focusing on vegetables, fruits, berries, regular fish intake, but it also in included things like whole grains, low-fat dairy, it did have some meat, but it did limit red and processed meat as well as sugar and salt and alcohol. And this study in particular found that after six months, the paleo diet group had a greater improvement in their body fat reduction and weight loss. But again, however, when they carried out this study much longer, up to 24 months or two years, they didn't see any significant difference in those parameters between the paleo diet group and the more plant-based group. Well, what might account for greater weight loss in groups following the paleo diet, even if it's just short term? Well, it's, it has been shown to be associated with increased satiety or an increased feeling of being satisfied or feeling full. One study showed that, that the paleo diet had an advantage over the Mediterranean diet in that respect, and that the group eating the paleo diet consumed less calories overall. Another study showed that people eating a paleo diet as compared to uh, a diet that was more plant-based and included grains had greater concentrations of two peptides, one called GLP-1 and one called PYY. And these two peptides are associated with greater senses of satiety or satisfaction or, or fullness after a meal. Another review study that looked at nine controlled trials with weight loss found that the paleo diet was better compared with more plant-based diets in terms of short-term weight loss and reduction in waist circumference. But the studies in all of these nine controlled, controlled trials had small sample sizes, not many people in the study, and they were relatively short duration, ranging from a few weeks to a few months. So that was weight loss. What about for heart disease? Well, researchers have actually looked at current day hunter-gatherer populations, and they found that those hunter-gatherer populations have relatively low serum cholesterol or blood cholesterol levels and low blood triglycerides, which is another form of lipid in, in the blood. And they also have a low incidence of heart disease. But interestingly, 
when these current day hunter-gatherer populations develop a more westernized diet, heart disease tends to increase, so much so that it equals or sometimes even surpasses that in Western populations. Another study in, in 2015 showed that adults who had high cholesterol, these, these adults were put into two groups. One group followed the paleo diet and one group followed an American Heart Association heart healthy diet. And again, that American Heart Association diet, basically plant-based, focusing on fruits and vegetables, but included whole grains and low fat dairy, as well as some poultry and fish. But this study found that the paleo diet group had significantly lower total cholesterol, lower LDL, which is that quote unquote bad cholesterol and triglycerides, and an increase in the good cholesterol, HDL, over the group that follow the American Heart Association diet. Another study in 2019 that looked at eight trials that looked at heart disease risk found that parameters like body weight, body mass index, body fat percentage, blood pressure, cholesterol, all those, those parameters improved in people following the paleo diet compared with a more plant-based diet. But when they really dug into the review of these studies, they found that if they removed some of the studies, the results were not as significant. So they concluded that although there were favorable effects from the paleo diet, we really need more evidence. The evidence that they found was not conclusive. Another study looked at paleo diet and metabolic syndrome. Now, metabolic syndrome is a group of conditions that includes increased blood pressure, increased blood sugar, excess body fat around the waist, and abnormal cholesterol levels. And metabolic syndrome increases the risk of things like heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. And in their review, the researchers found that the paleo diet had greater short-term improvements compared to a, a controlled diet that was more plant-based in terms of waist circumference, blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol. Sorry guys, I have my dog in the background. You may be hearing him growling. So the paleo diet was also looked at in terms of diabetes and diabetic type diets. And a study that looked at paleo diets compared to the American Diabetes Associated Association diet in type two diabetics found that the paleo group had a greater benefit on their blood sugar control and also on their cholesterol. And with the paleo diet, people in that group had more insulin sensitivity as compared to those following the American Diabetes Association diet. Another study that was only looking at diabetics on the paleo diet found that they had decreased fat mass and improved insulin sensitivity and blood sugar control. They were all following the paleo diet, but one group did have a specific exercise program, and they found that the exercise did not have any impact on those two, uh, those two parameters. Two interesting studies were published in 2017 that looked at the paleo diet and multiple sclerosis. Now, in both of these studies, the participants were on something that the researchers called a modified paleo diet. And we're gonna talk about specifically what that was. But on this modified paleo diet, the patients with multiple sclerosis found that they had improvement in their fatigue levels, improvement in exercise capacity, in motor function or how their muscles moved, and also had improvement in mental and physical quality of life. The second study that was looking at this modified paleo diet and multiple sclerosis used the paleo diet in combination with an exercise program, electrical stimulation of muscles, and stress management techniques. And they found that those patients with multiple sclerosis who had the combination of all of these had improvement in their mood and also in their cognitive symptoms, things like uh, their, their mental clarity. Although they had multiple interventions or multiple things that were going on in the study, and they all probably worked together to help 
bring about these improvements, the researchers concluded that the majority of the improvements in mood and also in cognition or brain function were related to the changes in their diet. So let's talk about what was this modified paleo diet. Well, in these instances with the patients with MS, all of them ate every day three cups of leafy greens, three cups of sulfur-rich vegetables, which are things like broccoli, cauliflower, onions, garlic, three cups of intensely colored fruits and vegetables a day. So that's nine cups of vegetables and fruits every day. In addition, there, there was less focus on animal protein than on more traditional paleo diets. And the researchers pointed out that the biggest dietary changes in these patients were the increased amounts of vegetables and fruits and the decreased amount of gluten. So what about studies that were counter to the paleo diet? Well, in looking at some of the review, review studies, the researchers pointed out that people who follow paleo diets, particularly if they follow them more long-term, can end up being deficient in things like vitamin D and calcium. And those two, you know, particularly because uh, the dairy products are excluded on the paleo diet. They could also end up with iodine um, deficiencies. A big source of iodine in the diet, again, are dairy products, but also uh, iodized salt. And added salt is also excluded on the paleo diet. Researchers also found that because the paleo diet is low in cereal grains and legumes and can be high in saturated fat, they can be worse for colorectal cancer survival in those particular patients. A 2018 review study looked at dietary patterns and heart failure prevention. They looked at the Mediterranean diet. They also looked at the DASH diet. The DASH diet stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop High Blood Pressure. And again, the DASH diet is essentially plant-based, focusing on vegetables and fruits, but it includes low-fat dairy and whole grains. And they found that both the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet did have a protective effect against heart failure, but the paleo diet did not. Another study published in 2019 showed that long-term following of a paleo diet, meaning more than six months, can actually change that GI microbiome. It can actually change the bacterial makeup of our GI tract, and not in a good way. It can change it so that we have more bad bacteria there. And these bad bacteria can produce a substance called TMAO. And research has shown that higher levels of TMAO can increase the risk of things like heart disease and other diseases in addition. The research has pointed out that in particular, high red meat concentrations can be the things, the components in the diet that cause this change in the gut microbiome leading to the increase in TMAO. So we should point out that there are limitations of the current or research, recent research on the paleo diet versus plant-based diets. Pretty much all of them were very small sample sizes, meaning that the numbers of people in them were less than 100, sometimes less than 30. They were really quite small. Most of them, again, were of short duration, ranging from a few weeks to a few months. A few of the studies that did carry it out longer tended to show that there was diminished benefit of the paleo diet over time. And also, these studies don't really take into account other components of that hunter-gatherer lifestyle, such as activity levels and also their environment. Uh, these are important factors that can contribute to lack of chronic disease. There are a lot more studies and a lot more data out there on plant-based diets. For example, the Mediterranean diet is one that has a lot more data available. And for example, the Mediterranean diet has been shown to decrease risk for things like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. And the researchers feel that it's mainly driven, the decreased risk is mainly driven by the higher amount of vegetables and fruits and whole grain intake. So there were some benefits that were shown in the research on the paleo diet. Why might that be? 
But when you compare it to the standard American diet, which is heavy in refined carbs and saturated fat, that standard American diet really contributes to inflammation. And again, we said earlier that this chronic inflammation is the root cause of a lot of our chronic illnesses. So the paleo diet, because they have a lot of dietary molecules, for example, things like polyphenols in them, these polyphenols, these molecules can actually inhibit these inflammatory pathways and decrease inflammation. And the, the crux of it is a lot of where the focus is on these polyphenols, on, on these other beneficial molecules, they're mostly found in vegetables and fruits. And again, the, the vegetables and fruits were the biggest component of that modified paleo diet that was beneficial for the multiple sclerosis patients, getting nine cups of fruits and vegetables a day. These vegetables and fruits have these bioactive compounds that can tamp down inflammation and inhibit these inflammatory components, things like eicosanoids. The vegetables and fruits can also protect cells from damage, damage from things like oxidants. They have a lot of things called antioxidants, including polyphenols that really blunt the damage from, from these oxidants that can change DNA and to lead to things like cancer down the road. The vegetables and fruits, especially the sulfur rich vegetables, things like cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, also things like garlic and onions, mushrooms, they are really helpful in eliminating toxins from the body. There are specific benefits to purple and red colored fruits and vegetables, things like blueberries, eggplant, red cabbage, those deep pigments are due to compounds called anthocyanins. Not only do they fight inflammation, but they fight oxidation. They've been shown to be especially helpful in, in the brain. It, they help to improve signaling between nerve cells. They've been shown to be helpful to improve cognitive performance and protective against neurological diseases like Parkinson's disease. Also nuts and seeds, they are very beneficial in a lot of ways. They've got a great source of energy, great source of, of good calories, because they have a lot of nutrients in them, good sources of protein and fat. They've got great fiber, they've got the polyphenols. All these things can have a beneficial effect on the gut microbiome, the good bacteria in the gut. They also can fight inflammation and they also have these monounsaturated fatty acids that have been shown to lower the risk for things like high cholesterol, dyslipidemia, obesity, and insulin resistance that can lead to diabetes. But what about the meat in the, in the paleo diet? Uh, can there be some benefits to meat and also with the wild fish? Well, both of these, especially grass-fed, it's really important to make that distinction. Grass-fed or pastured meat and wild fish have high amounts of omega-3 fatty acids. They're a type of polyunsaturated fatty acid. These omega-3s have been shown to reduce a compound called arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid promotes inflammation. So the omega-3s fight that. And they also are building blocks of compounds called resolvents, which are actual anti-inflammatory components that can help resolve inflammation that's already ongoing in the body. So the key here is the type of meat and type of fish. With the grass-fed or pastured meat and with the wild fish, they may, yes, very well contain saturated fat, but the type and the amount of saturated fat matters. Grass-fed beef tends to be leaner, not having as much saturated fat as grain-fed beef, and also Grass-fed beef tends to have different types of saturated fat in them, and these types of saturated fat may not affect cholesterol in a bad way. It may actually help cholesterol levels, help to improve them. So what about these uh, non-paleo foods? Is there a case to be made that they should be limited or even excluded? And again, those are foods that typically were not around during the Paleolithic era, and they include grains and legumes and dairy. Well, the issue with grains for, for a good proportion of people is gluten. 
gluten can cause real issues for a decent segment of the population. Some of them can get very significant gastrointestinal problems, skin problems, neurologic problems, even uh, skeletal problems. Some of these problems really are genetically related, but some are not. Some people just have sensitivities to them. But again, these issues with grains and with gluten don't affect everyone. So certain people, maybe it does certainly make sense to avoid them or limit them, but it doesn't apply to everyone. Now, what about legumes? The things like lentils, beans, peas, things like that. Well, one question that's come up about legumes is this question of lectins. Lectins are proteins that are bound to specific carbohydrates. And gluten is actually a type of lectin. Lectins are everywhere. They're found in animals, they're found in plants, they're found in microorganisms, and they're resistant to our digestive enzymes. In food, the main sources of the, of the lectins are in grains, and that includes gluten and non-gluten grains, but also legumes and nightshade vegetables, which include things like tomatoes and eggplant and also peppers. The problem with uh, the lectins is that some of them can be toxic. For example, in raw kidney beans, there's a lectin called phytohemagglutinin that can be poisonous. And agglutinins, again, a type of lectin, that are found in grains and legumes and nightshades. They can be toxic in high quantities, but in lower quantities, they do have the potential to interfere with absorption of our nutrients, and they could also promote inflammation. Cooking and boiling can inactivate most of these lectins, but not all of them. You can't completely get rid of all of them. And again, you know, not everybody is affected. Some people find they, they are bothered by lectins, but really it, it has a lot to do with genetic variation. Some people have an issue with it and some people don't. Well, what about dairy? Well, there can be allergies to dairy, there can be dairy intolerances, and there can be people who are bothered by some of the inflammatory components of dairy. Cow's milk allergy is one of the most common and it's found very often in early childhood, although adults can have it as well. And this can result in skin issues, eczema, hives. It can affect the respiratory system with, uh, with uh, rhinitis, or runny nose, asthma. It can affect the GI tract with vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. In more rare cases, it can lead to severe allergic reactions, such as anaphylaxis. But again, not everyone is affected that way. There's also lactose intolerance. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, certain people don't have that lactase enzyme or the activity of the lactase as they get into adulthood. And so they're not able to break down that lactose or that milk sugar. And so that can lead to things like abdominal pain, diarrhea, issues like that. But again, not everyone is affected that way. There also is though the case to be made for inflammation or inflammatory aspects to dairy. And in talking about inflammation, one of the main things to look at is these beta casein proteins. They're found in cow's milk and there's a, an A1 beta casein as well as an A2 beta casein. Now cow's milk may contain A1 only, A2 only, or both of them. But A1 is the one that's associated with gastrointestinal inflammation. It can actually increase blood markers of inflammation, as well as causing gastrointestinal discomfort. So for certain people, it may make sense to limit those, not, those non-paleo foods. But to make a, a blanket statement for everyone, there are downsides to excluding these. And if we do exclude grains and legumes and dairy, we're gonna miss out on some beneficial nutrients and health benefits. Grains have a lot of fiber, B vitamins and minerals. Legumes also have fiber, they're good protein sources as well as vitamins and minerals. And dairy, like we said before, is important for calcium and vitamin D. So what's the bottom line? Well, I think we can say that you know, the paleo diet, it may be helpful for weight loss and it might have beneficial health effects. And certainly, as we've seen, it does share 
components of other healthy eating plans, there's a lot of overlap between paleo diets and also plant-based diets, especially for those that are focusing more on the vegetables and fruits like that modified paleo diet. But as far as the data, we really need more studies with larger numbers of people participating and for longer periods of time to really make um, a good determination about that. So in the meantime, I think the average person, they might find that the paleo diet is really tough to do in terms of cost. Meat tends to be more expensive than grains and, and uh, other carbohydrates. And also it's difficult to exclude big groups of food like dairy, like grains. And the average person may do just as well, if not better, with a less restrictive, less meat focused diet. The focus is on a lot of vegetables and a lot of fruit and plant-based fats I would add in there as well, along with regular exercise. So I want to thank you for your attention. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it. And I'll turn that back over to Jeff and see if we can take some questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Marino, for such an in-depth and fascinating look at these two plans. I'll remind everyone to please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in order to submit questions. We already have a handful that have come in throughout the talk. So I'll share some of them now. Uh, Dr. Marino, we one question asking um, if uh, how these diets might work with intermittent fasting, another trend um, that is out there, and, and is, is intermittent fasting recommended or are there studies out there showing the health effects? That's a great question. There's really been a lot of interest in intermittent fasting as well. And I would say that in our practice, what we found to be helpful is um, a certain type <clears throat> excuse me, of intermittent fasting. There's different ways to do it. Some, some uh, intermittent fasting regimens require you to have a complete fast for one or more days a week. Other ones want you to do very limited calories for a period of days. But there's a certain type of, of intermittent fasted fasting that's also called time-restricted feeding. And I think that is something that is more doable for many people, and it has been shown to, to have good health benefits. What I mean by time-restricted feeding is setting a time in the evening when you're going to stop eating. And if you can do that for the next 12 hours, meaning that, for example, you stop eating by 8 p.m., you don't have anything until you wake up the next morning, and also not until 8 a.m. the next day. So you're giving yourself a full 12 hours without any food during that period. That type of intermittent fasting, if you will, has been shown to help with weight loss, it's been shown to help with blood sugar control, also with um, memory and people with cognitive issues. And it's something that is a lot more doable than going a day without any food or having very little calories for a couple of days a week. We also have a question from Hannah asking, is there a difference in responses to processed versus unprocessed dairy? You know, I'm, I'm not sure if I completely understand your, what you mean by processed versus unprocessed dairy, like, it, like in, or, or raw milks, maybe that's what you might be referring to. Um, I think you know, there are arguments to be made that some of the, the raw dairy is better for certain people, but I think you just have to be careful of your sources. If something is raw, meaning that it hasn't been pasteurized, I think you just want to be cautious of that. It may not be for everyone. So I have to say I'm really not an expert on the, on the raw or the raw dairy, but I think you, I'm not saying it's necessarily bad, but I think you want to be careful. Uh, William has asked, you know, you, you mentioned the documentary that helped to boost plant-based diets in the conversation um, in the country. Um, do you know what might be the origin of paleo's um, popularity and um, if there was an original group or um, science behind the research? Yes. Um, I don't know if you have access to the slides, you know, after this talk, but um, in my initial slides, um, talking about the the theory behind it, the evolutionary discordance, it does list the, the uh, one of the main authors, I want to go back 
let me see if I can find that. But um, one of the researchers, her, his last name is Cordain, uh, C-O-R-D-A-I-N. And actually, this research that, that came about about the evolutionary discordance theory, is actually something that's not that new. I think they were talking about it in the 80s. But um, it really just, for whatever reason, seemed to really catch on or capture the imagination of people more recently, like back when we saw on that Google trend slide back in say 2013, 2014. But the actual research on that and the actual theory was published um, much many years before that. Wonderful. And everyone, so that, that our uh, viewers do know, we will share a recording of today's talk um, in your email and you'll be able to view that on our YouTube channel so you can um, look closer at those slides. Uh, we Great. have two questions um, about another popular diet trend. Aaron and Kisna are asking about the keto diet and how does that, um, to quote Aaron, throw a curveball in these diets? Yeah, the good, really good question. Uh, the keto diet, keto standing for ketogenic, is really focused on increased fat intake, having more of your calories come from fat as opposed to carbohydrates. And the reasoning behind that is it will shift your metabolism so that you're using something called ketones for fuel. And that's been shown to help some people with weight loss. It's actually also been shown to help medically in certain uh, studies with things like memory, Alzheimer's disease, uh, because the Alzheimer's brain, for example, people with Alzheimer's, they, their brain cannot utilize sugar as a fuel source, but they, it can still util utilize ketones. So it's actually providing a source of fuel to the Alzheimer's brain that in, the other, in a way would be starving otherwise. And it's actually shown to have some benefit in those patients. There's also been some research showing that the ketogenic diet can be helpful in certain patients with certain cancers, because uh, certain cancers do especially feed off of sugar, as well as in patients that have seizure disorder. So it has been shown to be helpful um, in those instances. It is a lot more focused on, on fat, but again, you have to be careful. Uh, you want to, people who are following a keto diet, you want to make sure that the fat is of a good source. And the, the people that I trust that have been proponing, uh, promoting keto diets make the case that it's best to get your fat from plant-based sources. Again, not that you have to exclude meat. You could still have it, but it's got to be a small amount of your, of your intake daily. So I hope that answers it. It is different from paleo and it is different from plant-based in the sense that it is a lot more concentrated on fat and those kinds of diets have been helpful for particular medical conditions. But I think, again, if you're going to follow a keto diet, I think it is important to work with a nutritionist or work with a dietitian who can help you do that in the safest way. Wonderful. I think we just have time for one more question. Um, James asks, um, he asks if you had thoughts on the Whole30 diet, if you're familiar with that, but really he asks, is there really a best diet? Yeah, a great question. I mean, I think that the Whole30 can be really helpful. Uh, we've had many patients who've done it and it's helped them to not only lose weight, but to help you know, get their blood sugar under better control, their, their um, cholesterol under better control. So I think it can be very useful, but I think you raise a good point. There really isn't a one size fits all uh, in terms of diets, but I think what we tend to see in terms of like trends and looking at the nutrition literature is that there's a common theme and I think Hopefully you kind of got that from what we were talking about tonight, that the more vegetables you have, the more fruits you eat, the more you focus on those kinds of foods, as opposed to being very heavily invested in meat or in uh, refined or processed foods, the better off you're going to be. So those, I think those general ideas are important for everybody, but I agree there's not a one size fits all. 
Wonderful. Thank you again, Dr. Marina. This was a wonderful and fascinating um, chat. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everybody, for, for being on this uh, call. I appreciate it. We want to thank everybody for participating in our wellness webinar series today. We hope that uh, you with some new perspectives on your financial, physical, and mental health. As I mentioned, we will um, share a link to our YouTube channel um, in an email you'll receive uh, so that you can view these presentations again. I hope that you'll also join us for some of our upcoming alumni events. We have a number of uh, webinars and hopefully some in-person events soon. Uh, and you can visit that at jefferson.edu slash alumni events. We also hope that you'll support Jefferson's COVID-19 Better Together Fund. You'll receive a link to that in your email, or you can make a donation now at jefferson.edu slash COVID funding. The Better Together Fund is a special fund that was established to support the Jefferson community of students and employees as they adapt to the changing circumstances um, surrounding the pandemic. Um, as, of this, as of this evening, uh, we have received more than $2 million in gifts and matching contributions to the COVID-19 Better Together Fund, and we hope that we can count on our alumni to join us as uh, Bob Lockyer of the class in 1968 and his wife Carol have issued a challenge committing $7,500 once 100 alumni support the fund. Thank you all, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.